Hi, Birger. Thank you for joining us um, today. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We wanted to ask you a few questions about the exhibition and gigamapping in general. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit out of which necessity was the practice of gigamapping born? Yeah, I think this practice, it emerged quite organically from, uh, I was teaching a, a master studio and we were starting to address I think we call the course challenge of X complexity in yeah. 2006 or seven. And we experiment with making big posters to explain that complexity. Those posters were quite, still quite linear and not so very much um, networked with relations. In this next runs, we actually, I had a, quite a big class with uh, almost 20 students. And I put aside a lot of energy into uh, mapping as such, because I had a, a intuition that going more in that direction would be potentially very useful because designers are good at mapping and designers like to think visually. And uh, um, if designers should work with complexity, they uh, need to be use their normal tools to do that, not, not to import any kind of external model or, or orthodoxy of cybernetics or whatever kind of um, systems theory, but using designing as a way of addressing systems. As um, Harold says somewhere in his book, Harold Nelson, that designers are inherently, design is inherently systemic Though that is correct, but on the other side, designers are not so very systemic from their um, tradition. Um, I found that designers are very object oriented. They like objects. They are far less um, um, concerned about relations and how things are interconnected. And when we, we had visitors in the studio, they were immediately understanding what we were doing, even if they never seen anything like that before immediately drawn into it and, and realizing that this was a very interesting and valuable um, um, development. So maybe at around that time or a bit later, I realized that we were actually working with systems and that there was, I was aware of system theory, but I was not really connecting that early on, but realizing that non, no real, mapping orthodoxy or, or modeling principle can grasp the whole picture, which yeah, we wanted yeah. to see. We want to see the whole picture spanning from hard, um, like cause effect flows of materials, um, energy, etc., to emotions and culture, etc. Yeah. It's a tool that can bridge all these things and where you could actually connect apples and oranges and not keep those categories apart, but rather find the connections between those separate, separated categories. Yeah. Reaching them. Since you've introduced the practice of giga mapping, what has changed? It's, it's kind of weird to see that this year doesn't have a single map from our school. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, um, Thinking a bit about this, um, I think one tendency that has been here has been that we have become more um, project process oriented. So the maps have become the, 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 the maps that always have been process tools, they have been more consciously applied as process tool and uh, the, the urge to produce those communicative outputs in the end has sort of diminished. I think that was hap what's happened okay. here. So they're instrumental instead of final. Uh, it, it's kind of a very interesting mm -hmm. question because there's so many aspects to it. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, maps are like, like design objects. They are design artifacts and they are um, gigamapping is a um, design process that is nested inside a design process. And we use designerly ways of building this 
kind of shared um, understanding of complex systems. So the important thing is the shared understanding and the being actionable and having also the memory support by having those maps on the wall in rich design spaces and try and together walk through those or, or, or muddling through those really complexities. The synthesis maps uh, developed uh, by Peter Jones and uh, his colleague at uh, Ocadu mm -hmm. that have, as far as I understand them, have a slightly different purpose than exploring and unfolding and generating from the richness of the map. But they, they're, there's, the purpose of the synthesis map is more to draw things together and to, to, to reach some kind of consensus or conclusion, not, not in the form of necessarily solving a problem or so, but to synthesize yeah. the search um, information. This year and the symposium, there's a theme of playing with tensions. I think throughout the years, you can see tensions uh, are always part of systems. Yeah. Um, and but in the process of gigamapping, actually, what is the role of tensions there? Yeah, I think um, I really like this theme of tensions because we have a bias towards harmony and. Uh, and I think that's not always very productive. Um, I think um, social systems, which in the end, this is all about social systems. And plus, of course, nature and other systems around us, our environments. But seen from a human-centric or anthropocentric perspective, it's, it's all those uh, systems are human activity systems. And uh, uh, it's not very productive to um, um, rest in this uh, conception that or common unvoiced goal that we need to um, develop a harmonic environment. We need social safety for people to talk loudly and to be honest about what they say, but that doesn't really, is not really the same as, 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 um, as harmony. Yeah. So I really appreciate it. And in gigamapping, I think um, we try to do very extensive uh, stakeholder or informants, experts um, mapping and see where they, uh, where is their natural um, motivations, uh, their, how is, how, what are the drivers, etc. But we also want to look at uh, what, um, somebody called uh, affected bystanders. I don't remember exactly the reference now, but I really love that term. Yeah. Because we really need to remember that there are um, entities who are not represented in our stakeholder groups always. And, yeah. and entities that might be affected, being it human or non-human entities and or the future generations, so to say. So we try to represent those interests and try to unearth the, the conflicts or the contradictions between, um, between those different um, operators in the system. Uh, I want to ask you a few more questions about the specific exhibition. Um, but first, let me thank you for this very uh, clear explanation of the, the practice of gigamapping, Professor Seffeldson. And uh, thank you. Let's, let's move to the exhibition of, of yeah. this year. This is the website of uh, the RST Symposium where you can find all maps. Um, you go to explore RSD formats and you find system maps. Yeah. And then you, and you see all 17 maps, yes. Yeah. And we would uh, love for you, Birgit Stefansson, to highlight a few of them and um, tell us a little bit more from your expertise. Yes, I will just uh, make clear that I will um, um, comment these maps not based on the content, but on the, on the way they are built up and structured and commenting on, on uh, principles of mapping more than uh, and relating to their content. Yes. So, Start with this map. Um, 
it's uh, it chooses a circular um, layout, which is of course a very strong um, graphic way of of creating um, attention to the middle. Where I understand that there's sort of the ideal of or it's kind of the you could say maybe the goal of the whole system um, intention here is centered and uh, and the map sort of illustrates that a lot of different areas and sectors need to play into that central goal. Now, if we zoom in a little bit, um, this map is actually quite rich um, when it comes to looking at, um, at if you dive into those sectors, literary sectors, um, you have a lot of text in, organized in traditional network bubbles, like um, network diagrams that are um, depicted with entities and, and relations. But even inside them, you have another level of interrelations and connections, which I find highly interesting. And you even have some kind of grouping elements that bind some of those bubbles together again. So all in all, I think the map really um, opens up levels of complexity. It uses um, text, it uses uh, images and relations uh, and, and captured into relations. It, it can be referred to as systems and subsystems. It, and it doesn't fall into the trap to really try to um, construct a artificial hierarchy out of it, mm. which I also appreciate because I find those over ordered maps that are overly ordered uh, to be a bit uh, disturbing because uh, we all know when it comes to real life, it's probably not that simple. Yeah, now, real life is messy, huh? <laughs> Oh yes, I mean, um, we try to capture what we call real life then. We can discuss that in another forum, but, <laughs> but uh, it's, not that, it's not that we have control. It's not so that we can um, order a way real life messiness or uh, yeah. the fussiness mm -hmm. of what's happening all around us. Um, so if we are not, we need to sort of capture that if you want to work it with it as a design material. Yes, let's, let's look at another map. Yes, what I really like here are the different um, models. You try to grasp an, uh, um, a complexity and it's a clever um, approach to not try to do that with one, let's say one illustration or one principle of mapping, but combine several ones. This aligns very much to also to critical systems thinking, where where uh, uh, that part of the criticality in critical systems thinking um, says that we should look at system models critically and apply them to where they make sense, and deemed out of um, a practical approach. This map has at least one, two, three, four different. Um, um, systems maps mm -hmm. timeline. There's probably there's a bubble diagram. There's something that looks more like uh, system dynamics, and there's uh, something that is uh, based on the isometric, like uh, mapping of sort of kind of a location. Yeah, I really like that approach. Also, um, this is a very rich map. It has quite a lot of text, which I normally think should be limited. Uh, as long as you can draw it, you should draw it. I mean, getting lost in the complexity, getting lost in the woods, um, it takes some courage, it takes some stubbornness and stamina, but uh, normally you will always get out of it again. And I think all these maps you see here probably have been there. They have been lost in the woods. I'm, I'm not doubting that part of the process. <laughs> I mean, dealing with complexity, there's no, dealing with complexity, there's no way of making that easy without simplifying it. And then, then you're dealing with something else, not complexity. So um, I have no doubt that all of these maps, they have been there and suffering, <laughs> <laughs> but coming out with some kind of a synthesis and some kind of 
shared picture, but I think you should probably a general comment is to bring more of that um, messiness or or the, the, the richness of those places where you got lost into the process, bring it along with you and explain the interconnectedness. Because yeah. I mean, my definition of systems thinking is just the science of interconnectedness and uh, design is then the practice of interconnectedness. Systems thinking, to, to, to become a systems thinker, you have to turn your attention from the objects to the relations. So by mapping, we generate new objects <laughs> because we yeah. objectify. We like to be kind of natural way of thinking, but we have to really keep our attention to the relations, try to also describe them on a similar level as we describe the objects, yeah. name them, tag them, um, and color code them. So to, to dive into that part of the material. Yeah. One thing that is really nice to see now is that there are so many contributions from new actors, from, from schools that we haven't seen so many contributions from before. So that's really encouraging to see. Um, I'm more concerned, I'm not so concerned if this is done in the right way or not, because as you mentioned, no, giga mapping is, is an open source. It's, um, it's a flexible strategy and there's no way to doing it right. There's just better or worse ways to doing it. And uh, so I'm, what I'm really happy about is that more and more um, environments realize the power in designing uh, as a tool to understand complexity. Yeah. This map, um, what I really like with it is that there are, um, again, several different models almost. We can discuss what is a model and the difference between the model and the map, but you have at least some patterns, uh, some structures of, uh, of interrelated, interrelated uh, entities that are repeatedly interpreted in different ways here, packed into a bigger part of an environment. And these ones are seemingly very simple, but then developed more and more into a very complex interconnectedness. I might be not fair to this map <laughs> with saying this, but uh, um, I think it's an, uh, uh, what I see is uh, the tendency is to have those compartments in many of the maps. And I think that's fine, but I would really like to see larger emphasis on relations and how those compartments also are related to each other. Yeah. Birger Sevelsen, thank you for this, uh, I say this, this information and this um, almost sort of masterclass on giga mapping. <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone else is welcome to uh, look at the, the maps online and here in Delft uh, downstairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.